right before the break, uh, Mr. Weaver was still on the witness stand, and some of the jurors had submitted some questions. I have had a chance to review those questions and to talk about them with the attorneys while Mr. Weaver was outside the courtroom so that he couldn't hear our conversation. And based on the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law, I have decided that all of these questions are appropriate, although I have modified a couple of them. And so I'm going to ask all these questions. Uh, Mr. Weaver, the first question is as follows. Did the witness say no, excuse me, did the witness say no police in lobby area when normally present at the time of arriving at 10.30 p.m.? When I came at 6 o'clock, I noticed, the first thing I noticed, there was no police there. And then the same thing I noticed that when I came back at 10.32. The next question is, how long was it from the time the shooting began to when you made it to the lobby? It's hard to say because things are just going in like slow motion. So, um, I don't know, maybe... 10 to 15 minutes, but it was going so slow, it seemed like it was an eternity being on the floor of the theater, so. The next question is as follows. Did you see the shooter move any closer to the victims than by the exit near the screen? Um, when he started, he was shooting with the, uh, the gun, and then it got jammed, and I got up and grabbed Rebecca. It sounded like he was moving because the sound of the gun as I was falling over the, the steps sounded like he was moving in a different area, which made me more uh, scared and more afraid because I, it sounded like he was moving around the theater because it wasn't coming from the same place, and it wasn't the same sound. So, The next question is, after the initial shooting, did you see the shooter walk through the theater? Uh, after an instant, after he uh, did his first shots of the, the AR-15, or... Let me read the question again. After the initial shooting, did you see the shooter walk through the theater? No. He stayed in that corner as if he was positioned there, and he was just, just firm. Just answer the question. Yep. So the question is, he stayed in that corner. Is that correct? Um, yes. All right. The rest of the answer is stricken. The next question is, what did you see through the crack? Um, what I saw was, and this is, it's, it's just this, this white silhouette. I mean, this white like light, and you can see the silhouette of the gunman. And uh, he had something on his head. You could tell he had some gear on as if he was wearing a, like a football type outfit. And so he just kept. You could tell he was moving. The, it was moving, but at the same time, he was stationary in the same place. He just he never moved, so. Does that answer your question? I, I believe you've answered the question. Okay. The next question is, did the shooter move? Um, I want to say yes, just the simple fact that... <clears throat> well, let me stop you there. The question is, did the shooter move? And it's asking whether you have knowledge of that, whether you well, saw it... Well, hold on. Whether you observed it or not. You're not allowed to speculate. Okay. So, did what the else? shooter move? Um, yes, he moved. Because the gunshots came from different, you could hear it from different places. So obviously he moved from the corner. The next question is, how long did all of the shooting go on? Um, like I, I said before, it's hard to estimate or guess. I mean, I didn't, wasn't looking at my watch to see how long it was, but it feared like it was, it was eternity. So when something was going on like that, um, so, but in reality it was 10 to 15 minutes. The next question is, if you know, if you know, where in the theater did the second series of gunshots come from? Um, the second series of gunshots, you're talking about the shotgun? <laughs> I'm just reading the question from, okay. from the jury. The so. shotgun, when you started, when you start shooting the shotgun, um, it, it was, you could hear it from different directions, and I was, I was falling down. You could hear it as if it was coming, like, straight over this way or straight over that way, but not from the corner anymore. And the final question is, again, if you know, where was the shooter when you ran out of the theater? Um, the shooter was still shooting. Um, you can still hear the, uh, the shotgun going off as I was leaving the theater on the, on the right, the left side of the theater. Any follow-up questions, Ms. Tish McGuire? Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> So one of your first questions that you answered, Mr. Weaver, was 
regarding whether there were any police officers when you arrived at the theater inside the lobby. And you said, I think you said not at 6.30 and not at 10.30. Mm -hmm. Now, when you left the theater after the shooting and you were running out of the lobby, were there any police officers? Absolutely. They were coming in as we, I was leaving. They were coming the, on my left side as I was trying to get to the door, just like everyone else. And then the other question that you just answered, one of the questions that you just answered was that you described what the shooter was wearing as like football gear. What do you mean by that? Well, it looked like he had some type of helmet on and he had some type of gear. And it was hard to say if it was protective gear or whatever, but through the silhouette, you can see that his shape was not of like, say, if he didn't have anything on. Um, it looked like he had some type of equipment on, and so you couldn't really tell what it was, but it looked like some type of protective gear that a football player would wear. So that's why I use that analogy. So some sort of bigger padding around. Absolutely, there. yeah. No further questions. Thank you. Any follow-up questions, Ms. Spengler? No. May this witness be released from his subpoena? Please, Your Honor. Any objection? All right, sir, thank you. Call your next witness, please. Solemnly swear or affirm the penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. All right, please be seated. Could you please tell us your full name and spell your first and last names? Natasha Cabway, N A T A S H A, last name Cabway, C A B as in boy, O U E T. Ms. Pearson, you may proceed. Officer, where do you work? Aurora Police Department. And are you a police officer? Yes. How long have you worked at the Aurora Police Department? Five years. Did you work in law enforcement prior to that? Yes. Where did you work? Montgomery County Police in Montgomery County, Montgomery County, Maryland. How long did you work there? Four years. Were you working uh, at the Aurora Police Department on July 20th of 2012? Yes. What did your duties consist of at that time? I was working patrol, so I was working graveyards, patrol, graveyards meaning the hours I worked, 10 p.m. to 8 a.m., um, responding to calls, dispatch. Did you hear a call for officers to respond to the Century 16 Theater on July 20th? Yes. How did the call come out? I don't remember exactly. I think I just remember hearing shooting. Do you recall what time it was? I do not. Was it after midnight? Yes. Do you recall where you were at the time that you heard the call to respond, for officers to respond to the theater? Yes, I was on another call um, with officers dealing with some type of civil dispute um, in the area of Central High School. I think it's like 11th and Peoria in Aurora. Did you respond from that location to the theater? Yes. Did, was the call for specific people to respond or was it a general request for cars to respond? It was for everybody. How long did it take you to get to the theater? Maybe a minute or so, I'd guess. When you got to the theater, what did you observe? Um, chaos. And, let's, and we'll talk outside <laughs> first. So when you arrive outside first, and I, let's back up a minute. How did you approach the theater? Do you recall from what direction you were coming? I came from Alameda, so I was coming from Denver, so I was heading eastbound Alameda, and then I took a right into where the, the theater parking lot is. Can't tell you specifically what street it is, but um, came eastbound Alameda and then took a right into where the theater is. In the parking lot, what did you see? Um, just chaos, people running and running. <laughs> did you see other police officers there at that time? Um, yes, but I can't tell you specifically who was where. It was just kind of surreal. Do you know where you parked in relation to the theater? Yes, I would have been on the south, if, if I'm using Alam, I'd probably say it's southwest side of the theater. I was in the front, but south of it to the west of it. But on the front side of the theater? Yes. Would, would a map help you to illustrate where you were? Sure. 
And let's see. We have a variety to pick from, Your Honor. May I approach with, let's, I guess, with two of these, Your Honor? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been previously marked as People's Exhibit so, 4741. Does that one help illustrate where you were? With the theater down here, or is this one too large? No, that, that's, that's good. Do you want me to point? If you could, please. Oh, oh wait, hold on. Table. Make sure you speak into the microphone. Sorry, I'm just trying to get... Get oriented. So Alameda is down here. Alameda would oh, be up here. Oh, up there. And this is 225, and then Sable is marked right there on the... I might flip it. Give me, I'm sorry, give me a okay, second. Just a second. Let me, maybe a different one would work better. If, and this is People's Exhibit 4740. If this is the front of the theater, right here. Yeah, so I was like somewhere in here. So somewhere to kind of the north and west of the theater? Sorry, yes, north. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. When, when you parked there, what did you do first? Um, right when I had parked, somebody came across the radio saying that make sure you had your gas mask. So I went to my trunk to find my gas mask. <laughs> did you have it with you? I did, luckily. And were you able to get it out? Uh, yes. Um, and there I was accompanied by another officer, too. He happened to be running up at the exact same time and threw some stuff in my trunk um, that he just couldn't carry. What kinds of things did he throw in your trunk? Honestly, I don't, I think, I don't remember. I just remember he was grabbing his gear and I have no idea. Did you go towards the theater with I, your gas mask? I did. Do you recall how you entered the theater, the theater um, complex? I went through the front door. Um, prior to getting to the front door, I know I got stopped um, by some victims, I believe, I don't know if it was two or three women, but um, they were just saying, you know, she's been shot and, you know, pretty much helped me. And I kind of did like a quick assessment to see, okay, is, you know, is anything falling out or whatever? And, you know, I don't know where she was injured at, but, you know, looking at her from the front, there was nothing necessarily protruding or whatever. And I'm like, can you make it to the fire truck? And she's like, yeah. And I just, I remember seeing a fire truck as I was running up. And so I pointed in the direction of the fire truck and I know, you know, hopefully I sent him in the right direction. And then I went to the front door of the theater. Did you go into the lobby? Um, I did. When you entered the lobby, what did you see or what did you experience? Um, before I even made it into, I think as soon as I opened the front door, that's when I got struck by the gas. Um, I had my mask on, apparently not tight enough, because <laughs> I immediately sort of like kind of have that coughing, can't breathe feeling. Um, and, and then I had to pretty much tell myself to buck up and readjust and put it on properly, and then I actually went full into the theater. When you entered the lobby, did you see other, off, other police officers in the lobby? Um, I did see, just straight ahead, there was a female in front of me that was on a corner um, posted up. Did you go into Theater 9? I did. How did that occur that you ended up going into Theater 9? Well, when I first went in, like, I saw a female on the outside of some theater, um, and then I was with her, and then I heard somebody yell to my right of me saying, hey, we, you come with us, you have a mask on. Um, so I was assuming obviously they needed me to go into the theater because I had a mask on. So went into theater nine, went in on the right side when I came in. Did, were you familiar with this theater complex? Not at all. So you had not been to theater nine before? No. When you went into theater nine, did you go in then with another police officer? Uh, yes. And do you know who you went in with? I believe Officer Baker was behind me, and then um, another officer, I think Officer Rowland was the one that told me to go with him, possibly. When you first entered the theater, what was it like? Surreal. <laughs> um, when I first went in, there was a guy at the very end of the, because the, the, the seats were to my left, um, so I kind of went, like I said, I went down the right side, and there was a guy laying there on the floor. Um, all I remember was in a green shirt. And I went directly to him. I, I just remember I, officers are in there everywhere, but I just saw him. So I went to him to see if he was okay. Um, and I think he had said he'd been shot in the back. So I was kind of dealing with him. And then that's at some point I turned around. I don't know whether it's because somebody said something, but that's when they started carrying people down from the seats behind me. 
When you first entered the theater, did you know whether or not a suspect had been arrested? No. So what were you expecting when you went into the theater? A gun battle. Did you have your gun drawn when you went into the theater? Yes. Now, you said when you went in, after you'd seen this person in a green shirt, that they were trying to get people down from the stadium seating? Yes. How was that occurring? Did you see it? Well, first of all, did you see a number of people in the stadium seating? I kind of just tunnel visioned a little bit. I'm sure there was more people in there than I saw. Um, the only people noticeably that I, I noticed in the theater is when I turn around, there was um, a guy apparently deceased. He was, he was folded over. So he's the only person I really noticed. And then they were carrying um, a woman down, which later I found out and helped out with that was Ashley. Ashley Mosier? Yeah. The person that you saw that to you appeared deceased, where was that person? So, um, like most theaters are kind of split up. There's you know, the top part, and then there's a railing and a little bit of a space, and then the bottom part. So he was directly behind that railing, kind of folded over. I guess so the, fir the first row, so it was like the first row of seats, and then there's the railing, so, and he was folded over there. Now, you said you had tunnel vision when you were in the theater. Do you know why that was? It was just surreal. Like, I just, it was, <laughs> it was supposed to be my last night of working graveyards, and I just didn't expect that to be my, my last night and last call. So it was just, just the whole arriving, people running, smoke, gas, just, it was just surreal. You were talking about the fact that you uh, helped with someone named Ashley Mosher. Yes. Or who you later learned. Yes. Where was this person in the theater? Um, again, I don't know specifically where she was seating, because by the time that I started assisting, they, again, I don't know how far they'd already brought her down, but pretty much when they got down to that first row again, I guess, where that guy was also deceased, that's kind of when I turned around and, and helped carry her from there and then out the theater. What did you observe about her injuries? Um, she'd been shot. I couldn't, I didn't really necessarily know exactly where until we got in the car. Where did you take her? Um, Aurora South. No, I'm taking Sorry. her from the theater. <laughs> that was not a very good question. From where you first encountered her at, at about the beginning of the stadium seating in the theater, where did you... Directly out the exit. Like, pretty much down, and then I guess there was an exit directly in front on the same side that we were on. Did it take more than one person to... to yeah, there was her? a few of us carrying her. Once you got her outside, what did you do with her? Um, my part, or, Officer Grizzle rolled up in his car, and then we put her in the car, and then I got in the back with her, um, and we took her to Aurora South. Did, did anyone else get in the car as well? Uh, yes, her boyfriend. And do you know, did you ever learn who that person was? Yes, Jam Jameson. What was his demeanor like? Frantic. <laughs> um, screaming, because at first, we was, were just trying to, sorry. Uh, was he screaming about Veronica? Uh, yes, I didn't know her name at the time, but is that Ash I think that it's Ashley's daughter, so yes. He was screaming about a child? Yes. And you said he was frantic? Yes, because um, we weren't even going to have him get in the car with us, um, but he was pretty adamant just to go with us. He's like, you know, screaming, that's... That he wanted to get yeah. in. So when you were in the car, you said you got into the back seat. And you need to answer out loud for the court reporter. Sorry. <laughs> Was that a yes? Oh, yes. When you were in the back seat, what were you doing? Um, just applying pressure to her wound. Um, it was on her chest. Was she conscious? She was. Um, I just was asking her everything and anything to keep her talking. Um, Wiley Trove, and uh, she was, for the most part, I mean, I, I can't even, I just remember, I, I think that's when I finally got her name, she told me her name, she told me about her daughter, um, I think I asked her her age, we might have even talked about school, I don't know, I just was saying everything I could just to keep her, her talking. Um, it wasn't until we got off the highway and we hit on um, Mississippi to turn on Potomac, and she stopped, <laughs> sorry. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm coming. Hold on. I'm sorry. That's all right. It's okay. There's some cleanings up here, too. By the time we pulled into the hospital, she stopped. She stopped talking, and she lost consciousness. <sighs> and I really thought she just died there in front of me. So I just, by the time we got there, like they, the emergency room, they came out, and I was like, she stopped talking, she stopped breathing, and then they took her in. Um, <sighs> I wanted to go back with Officer Grizzle to go help <sighs> with more people. But I can't remember who somebody told me I had to stay at the hospital and deal with the victims as they arrived because I was the first officer there. While you were at the hospital, and this was at um, Aurora South? Yes. Did you see other people who appeared to be victims of gunshot wounds arriving at the hospital? Yeah, they came in. Um, just, just kept coming in. Did you see how they were arriving? Were um, they? I didn't because I was already inside, so I don't know how people were arriving. <laughs> While you were in the hospital, did you talk to some of the people that were arriving? I did. Um, I talked to Petra for a little... I'm sorry. Is that someone that you later learned was Petra Anderson? Yeah, I believe she told me her name there. She was, it, we, we talked. We were able to talk. And did you do something for her to assist her? I did. Um, I, I'm like pretty sure I was assigned to, like I said, every victim that came in. So, um, but yeah, so I was trying to get her name and information. So I got her name and information. So somebody I can contact for her. Um, and I know I called her mom. And by the time, and I again, I was dealing with other patients. And I know I had gone out in the lobby at some other point, and her mom had been out there. I don't know how long. And she's like, "Yeah, I'm waiting." And I'm like, "How how long have you been sitting out here?" And I'm like, I, didn't, I don't think they knew you got here. And so I went back inside to find, like, um, who, I don't know if it was Petra's nurse or whomever. And they're like, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't find out where her mom is or anything like that. We couldn't contact mom because we couldn't get the information. So no sooner I got it from Petra, she totally forgot, couldn't tell them anything. Um, and she just, for that fraction of a moment, she was able to remember for me, for me to be able to call her mom. So it's kind of a cool story. <laughs> you recall... Do you recall seeing other people arrive with, do you recall any of the other specific injuries yeah, you saw? Yeah, so I, I spoke to, I think I called him KG in my report, but I think it's Casey. Um, he had an injury to his leg. I think he said, first thing he had asked was like, he was very calm and he just was like, hey, can someone just give me some ibuprofen? Um, so I spoke to him for a little while. There was another guy that came in. I don't know, I didn't get his name because um, he was in a lot of pain and there was a lot of screaming. Um, I know I spoke to... A young girl, I believe she's in my report. Her name is Caitlin. I think she was there with another friend named Caitlin. I spoke to them. Um, I know I spoke to a couple other um, witnesses, I'm sorry, victims, as I was um, helping, I think it's the married couple, when I was um, helping CSI. I know I went and stuck, checked on Stefan. I kept going back and checking on Ashley. Pretty much anybody that came in the hospital, I checked to talk to. Now, you said you also assisted the CSIs and those are crime scene investigators? Yes. And what did you do for them? Um, I can't remember specifically. I know I just helped whatever she needed to do, the officer. I don't know if I was helping holding stuff, but I pretty much went around with her. She collected evidence. At some point, did you go back to the theater? Uh, yeah. Do you recall what time that was? I don't. I... Were you at the hospital all night? Yeah. I was the house. I went. I, lucky enough, since I worked graveyards, I actually got off technically on time. So I think I probably got back to the uh, theater maybe by like 7:30 a.m. Somewhere in that time, maybe 7, 7:30 or something. Now, had you driven a police car to the theater? I did. And you had not taken it to the hospital, is that no. Right? Did you find your car at the theater? I did. It had been. I, for, I had to find it. It wasn't where I left it. What kind of condition was it in? Um, it was bloody when I found it. I remember just being blood on my computer, blood on my water bottle, and there was blood in the back seat. Thank you. I don't have any more questions for you. Ms. Brady, any questions? Thank you. It looks like the jury has a question for you. Sorry. Sorry. Do you mind? No. All right. Thank you.
Would counsel please approach? Ma'am, the jury has submitted some questions, and based on the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law, I have determined that they are appropriate, and so I am going to ask these questions of you now, okay? Okay. The first question is, when did you put your mask on? At what point? Um, as soon as I arrived and got, once I heard, as I rolled up, that's when I heard whoever come across the radio to make sure, you know, put on your gas mask. So I got out the car and I put my gas mask on. The next question is, you said that the gas hit you at the door. Is that the entrance of the lobby or the theater? Um, the entrance of, and again, I don't, I don't know if you have pictures of the inside of the, all I know is when I opened, like coming from outside, I opened the door, that's where I felt gas. Now, whether there's also, again, I can't remember, whether I can't know if you open that door and then you're in a little cubicle and open another door, but when I opened the front door of the theater, I could smell gas from there. Ms. Pearson, do you have any follow-up questions? Just now, you said that you smelled gas when you walked in the front door of the theater. Did you notice any difference in the concentration of the gas smell when you went into Theater 9? Um, I would say um, no, because once I got hit from literally opening the front door from outside to go into the, sorry, theater itself, that's when I tightened down my gas mask, so I should not have been affected. So once I, once from that point on, I was fine for the rest of the time in the theater, when I officially went in the lobby and when I was actually in Theater 9. Thank you. Any follow-up questions, Ms. Brady? Okay. All right. Thank you. May this witness be released from our subpoena? She may. Any objection? No. All right. Would counsel please approach? Members of the jury, can everybody stay here until about quarter after five today, or uh, do you need, is there anybody who needs to leave at five or before quarter after five? Raise your hand. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Mr. Brockler, call your next witness, please. Bernd Hofler, Your Honor. You solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay, please be seated. Please tell us your full name and spell your first and last names. My full name is Bent Ray Hofler. First name is spelled B-E-R-N-D. Last name is Hofler, H-O-E-F-L-E-R. 
You may proceed, Mr. Brockler. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, would you please tell us what you do for a living? I am a lieutenant with the Aurora Fire Department. How long have you been with the Aurora Fire Department? Uh, since 2003. I'm going on my 13th year. Did you do any firefighter work prior to 2003? I, I began, my, uh, began my career with uh, Southwest Adams County as a reserve and a short time paid there. How many years did you do that before you went to Aurora? About two years. Any other uh, EMT type work before Adams County? No, sir. All right, now you say you're a lieutenant. How is that job different than, let's say, we had Mr. Herrera up here earlier? Uh, we all have uh, specific assignments, kind of like a football team. When we show up on scene, we all have goals of what we want to obtain, and the lieutenant will kind of be like the quarterback where he calls the play, and the other guys run it most of the time. Do you work out of a specific station in Aurora? Yes, I work out of station too. Is that the same station we heard that Mr. Herrera had been out of? Yes, sir. Do you get called out when he gets called out? Not all the time, only on specific calls. I want to take you back to July the 20th, 2012. Did you get called out from station two uh, on that morning? Yes, sir. Why? Uh, we were called out on a uh, gunshot at the theater. Uh, at the time, we thought maybe three, four people shot. Now, you said you don't get called out at the same time as some of the other fellows in the, in the station. What were the circumstances under which you got dispatched to this particular scene? Uh, depending on the uh, hazard casualty and what the first officers asked for, um, we'll start escalating the call as we see a need for resources. And so uh, some, most times, and um, especially during that time of the theater shooting, when a single shooting came in, we sent a engine, a truck, and a battalion chief on one person shot, and that's your first response. How is your position related to the battalion chief? Uh, the battalion chief oversees the battalion of so many stations. Each chief in, our, uh, in Aurora, Colorado has five stations. Now, what made this particular call out unique in your mind? Uh, the way it escalated. Um, about that. Uh, shooting in North Aurora is not out of the norm. Uh, we get quite a few of those. I've been on probably over 100 in my career up there. And uh, so when we were going and we heard three, four people shot, it, it was not out of the norm until we started hearing the panic on the police radio. Describe that. Uh, you could tell the, the cops had been there a little while by the time we were en route. Uh, the first engines were dispatched. It takes them a little while to get out of the barn. Get, get on scene and then them to request resources and ask for us to come. So we're probably five, six minutes in when uh, we get called and I, my computer gives us updates faster than they can speak it out. And I, I could see how many patients and how many people were calling. So I switched to the police channel. And while they're waiting that duration for more crews, you could hear a panic. Had you heard that before? No. What did it do to you in terms of your response to go out to the scene? I just, it, it let me know that we were going to something different. And so what'd you do? I turned to my crew and I said, hey guys, we got something different here. We got something out of the norm. Be ready for anything. And? And when we got on scene, uh, we probably weren't ready enough for that. Well, what kind of vehicle did you go in? We're in a uh, ladder truck, a hundred foot ladder truck. Are you in the same kind of, I'm going to say, an, are an engine and truck different? Forgive me, I don't. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, essentially, the engine carries water to the scene, the ladder truck carries tools. So, like, yes, when will we go together? If we have an extrication, they will go take care of the patient. We will cut the patient out. If we go on a shooting, they will go for the patient care, and we will go for extrication of the patient if they need special tools. Was there a specific assignment you thought you would have then at this kind of panicked call out? Uh, I, I thought when we first were dispatched, we just thought we had extra patients, third, fourth, fifth patient, until I could hear the officers on the radio calling for help in the rear. Now, because you're a lieutenant, does that mean that you don't have experience actually dealing with the medical treatment and triage of gunshot wounds or patients? No, sir. We're all trained at least at an e EMT level, and uh, most of our crews are paramedics. All right. How long does it take you to get on scene? On scene? We're on scene to the entrance of the theater in about 10 minutes. Now, is that the front entrance of the theater? That's the entrance off Sable on the east side. Okay. Um, with the court's permission, I'd like to publish uh, 47, 
40. Is it 41? Thank you. I think 40. it is. You, it may be published, whichever one you want. Okay. <laughs> we'll just run through them. Um, go ahead and take some water. Thank you. All right. Does this help you describe for the jury what it is you did on scene at least before you went into the theater? Um, it's a little bit. A different picture might be better for us. You knew that was coming. Uh, forty. How about forty-seven forty? How about that one? That helps. Okay, great. Can you do us a favor? Would you mm -hmm. stand up with the the s stick here? And There's a microphone back oh, here. Oh yeah, sorry. Sir. Okay. A handheld. Okay. You need to turn it on. Okay. Uh oh, I don't. I didn't hear you tread yet. Oh, you're good. okay. Okay, you're good. And would you talk us through when your truck arrived, where it went, and what you started doing? So we come down Sable from uh, Sixth Avenue, and we take this entrance up here. As we pull up, we're told to stage. Um, immediately upon pulling up on scene and saying staging. What staging means is they're getting ready to allocate you for resources where they're going to send you what they're going to do. Um, commands got so many calls and he's so in uh, inundated at that time he can't really keep up. But as we pull into the scene, we're getting blocked in by police cars. We can't make entrance. We're literally up over here because we're blocked out by police cars. So I self-designed us. I said, we're going to the rear of the theater. I called command, let them know, and we started going over those uh, medians. There was a uh, bigger median up here. We jumped that. We went over that. Maybe it's this one. And we ended up in the rear of the theater right next to the uh, suspect's car. So you drove the big old fire truck ladder thing up over those things? Yes, sir. Okay. When you were there, did you see any other emer fire emergency vehicles or just police cars? Uh, no, I could see Engine 8 and Tower 8 in the front. Why did you choose to go to the back? Because I could hear the cops calling for rescue in the rear. All right, so you get to the back, and <coughs> by the way, do you need to keep standing to talk us through what you did? at the? And I'm asking because <laughs> if you say yes, then you will stand. If you say no, I will take this off the screen and we can keep talking. Um, well, well if we want to talk about like, the ambulances or anything and the lack thereof, Let's do that. Okay. okay. T tell us about the scene back here. How many other emergency medical support vehicles are behind the theater at the time you get there? None. So as, as we're coming up and we're taking these uh, medians, it, it takes us probably a good two minutes to get 75 yards. You got people running out. You got cars getting out. You got everyone trying to get in. So it's, it's a very slow process to get back there without running anyone over and trying to get to the rear of the theater where they need our help. Now, do you have um, lights on when you're doing yes, this? Yes, sir. I, is there a, an audible siren going? Uh, yes, sir, but we're probably not blasting it at that time. When you say there's people everywhere, are these uh, uniformed first responder types or civilians? Uh, mostly civilians. So what are they doing? Running. Okay. Okay, keep going. Uh, so then just knowing that this is actually a rather large field, that's what it took us to get through here. I didn't think I'd be able to bring any ambulances back through there. And uh, knowing how long that field was to uh, move people that gravely wounded over a field is what led us to uh, transporting cop cars. Now, was that a decision that you helped make was to say, we're just going with police cars because that's the only thing that's going to work? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the way that decision was made, um, one of the females who passed was being carried out by the officers and handed off to a couple fire guys and we had nowhere to put her. And the cop out of frustration said, forget it, I'll throw her in the cop car. I looked at the lead detective back there, the, or uh, whatever his rank is, I don't know, the lead officer. And I asked him, I said, will you guys do that for us? Will you transport in cop cars? And he said, absolutely. And then they lined up and we started triaging the nine down plus two we had coming out of the theater. Okay, let's talk about that. And go ahead and take your seat then. Yes, sir. And you can go back to the other microphone. Thanks, Amber. All right, now you had mentioned some numbers there uh, about victims, and we talked about triage, and I want you to make us a little bit smarter on how that process works. Tell us how the triage system works when you come up to a mass casualty situation like this. So triage is uh, set up to save the most savable lives. Okay, and the most gravely injured. 
if uh, you are uh, pulseless and not breathing, you are tagged as black. It's just a color reference, nothing else. And uh, that means we'll adjust your airway, we'll see if we get you breathing. If not, you're tagged black, we move on to the next. If you're tagged red, um, you've got a pulse, a breath rate, a uh, BP between a certain area, or you've got injuries that we think are threatening to your life. Yellow is decent injury, serious injury, but you're not going to die. And green is the walking wounded. So once we uh, triage, we will uh, eliminate the black because you can't spend time on them when you have that many people. You will prioritize the red because they're the ones in need of the hospital the most and then move down towards the yellow and the green. Now outside this, behind what you came to know as theater number nine, tell me about that triage assessment, who you came across. Well, what we came across was blood and bodies everywhere. Um, it was like a horror film. You had people in theatrics, people in costumes running around, not really sure who shot what. Uh, and then you had bodies down. Everyone who was shot in the back was tagged red uh, with life-threatening injuries. And uh, we had everything from a lady shot to the neck with her guts eviscerated to uh, a young woman with her hand blown off, shot in other places, and people laid out, shot repeatedly next to her. Now, a couple things bef before we move from that scene. Just for the record, you used the term eviscerated. What does that mean? It meant her uh, insides, her bowels were hanging out of her skin. Okay, and did you particularly treat or direct her treatment with her? Uh, two of the firefighters on the scene grabbed her and assisted putting her in a police car. And by this time, Engine 5 showing up and they're helping out, so I get four more guys. Now, as a lieutenant on a scene, are you typically a hands-on kind of person from the fire department? Uh, it depends on the call and the need of the call. In this situation, it was all hands on deck. We had way too many victims to sit back and watch guys work. I had to get in with the guys. And How long were you behind the theater before you went inside the theater? I couldn't give you an honest answer. I would estimate about five minutes. And during those five minutes, were you at all hands-on with patients or more assessing the scene? Uh, went through and did a quick triage and account of the patients. I attempted to call command one time um, and request that we could get an ambulance. This was before I'd made the decision to go in the cop car. And uh, then I was helping the guy. Once we made the decision to go into the police car, I was helping the uh, firefighters load the victims. You remember how many red or black you had behind the theater before you go inside? In the exterior, there were nine red and uh, two more essentially black being brought out. Okay. Um, how does the decision get made for you to go inside the theater? Why do you do that? Uh, because we still need a triage and uh, get our medical guys in there and check for any survivors. Now at this time, do you have any awareness at all what the situation with the shooter is? No, no idea what the situation with the shooter is, how many there are, who there is, none. Don't know if they've got them in custody or no if idea. they're still around? None. So what did you do to protect yourself as you went into the theater? Uh, we have a saying in uh, the fire service, we'll risk a lot to save a lot. We had a lot of lives to save that night, so there was no protecting ourselves. Who did you go in with? I went in with paramedic Hallsworth. And uh, we, we had one of the new guys stage at the door did with you, a backboard in case we found someone. Did you go in through that uh, back door that leads right into nine? Yes, sir. We went up through the alleyway, and I remember stepping over weapons, piles of ammunition, uh, ammunition and uh, uh, blood everywhere. When you got inside theater number nine, were there other uh, first responders, paramedics already there? Uh, to my knowledge, there were three or four cops with flashlights still searching, searching uh, with their guns drawn, looking for uh, shooters, anyone hiding anyone. I like thought the, the theater was full of what I believe was uh, tear gas. Why do you say so, that? Uh, because the way our eyes burned and our uh, noses started to run, and the, I've been around tear gas before, so I had a feeling that's what it was. Did, did you um, leave then because of the tear gas? No, we had to look for survivors. Tell us what you found. Uh, well, uh, we came up to the uh, first stairs. You can all see the, uh, the way the uh, theater's laid out. And if you look, essentially you had 10 bodies laid out. Uh, some of them trampled. Uh, some of them missing parts of their head. 
um, mass, mass injuries. Uh, and, you know, in the size of that theory, theater, you had body, 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 uh, up till 10. And so we started at the first one in the bottom right corner and worked our way up from there. Now, as you're working your way up the theater to check on potential survivors, are you taking time to document where every body is located and all that? No, sir. Uh, what we're in there, we're looking for anyone who's got survivable injuries. Anyone breathing uh, will come up. Uh, we'll check for a pulse, and then we'll adjust an airway. Um, except for in this situation with the amount of injuries, there were a lot of airways that didn't need to be adjusted because there was injuries incompatible with life. What does that mean? It, uh, it essentially means you have brain matter outside, you have half your head missing, you, there's no way you can survive a wound like that. Were there any um, people that you came across that in a different setting you would have attempted to save them or revive them? Yes, sir. Tell us about that. Um, I believe it was the third victim I came to. Uh, he, he always sticks out in my mind because it was so different. He, he wasn't obviously dead in there. He was still very warm, very limber. Um, I, and uh, at this point, me and paramedic Hallsworth had split up. He was going left and I was going right so we could do it quicker and try and find anyone. And when I came to him, I checked him. And the way his body presented, I, I, you know, I wanted to save him. I wanted to work him. And I uh, did an airway adjustment. He didn't start breathing, but uh, he was still so warm that I called paramedic Holsworth over. I said, Donnie, come over. Let's, uh, let's double check this. And Donnie uh, double checked it, and we had to tag him black because the amount of, uh, amount of victims you have, you can't commit resources to the one guy who's passed. So we had to count him black and then move on to the rest. Listen, listening to you talk about it, I can hear something in your voice. Are you thinking back on this and affected by it? I, I, I can close my eyes and see the picture of the theater. Um, the objection is untimely because he gave the answer before the objection. Uh, but you should move on, please, Mr. Brockwood. Yes, thank you. Um, the request is denied. Here's what I would normally do if this model had been much larger than it is, is I would have you come down and point out where you went. But it sounds like a lot of this wasn't documented at the time. It wouldn't be specific. You would be uh, guesstimating on some of the rows. Is that fair? Um, some of the rows I'd be guesstimating, but I can tell you exactly where I went. Your Honor, could, could we do that? And that would be the end of this part of the, the, the testimony. It, with the court's permission, if I could have him grab the uh, <coughs> microphone and come yes. down. Look, you're, you're big. Could you pick it up? And just <laughs> Thank you. Hold it? Oh. Here, get, and I hope this is the right angle for this. More, more, more. Thank you. Good. Okay. Go, go ahead, sir. And then we're going to turn it to, the, to these folks, and we'll do the same thing. Okay. So essentially, we parked our vehicle right here, and after we triaged the nine people laid out, and the two that had come out, we entered through this entrance over here, stepping over ammunition, weapons, and blood. We entered, and we came to the first victim right about here. And uh, like I said, it was dark. It was, it was, it was nasty. There's tear gas, and I kneeled down to adjust the first victim's head, like we do for any triage. And my paramedic put his hand on me, said, "It's you know, injuries incompatible with life. We need to move on." So I, I looked at him, I said, okay, I'll go right, you go left. I had a victim smashed down up here, looked like they had been trampled. Uh, the third victim I spoke about was over in this area. That's the one I called Donnie back over as he was working victims up over in here. Uh, he had come back and checked with me. We decided to tag him black. I proceeded up. I had a victim in one of these middle rows and uh, most of his head had been uh, removed. So I didn't get uh, very good close. I didn't adjust this airway. And I came up for one more victim, and we had one more female up in here, victim, as I met Donnie. How many you got, Donnie? I got five. I got five. We got ten. Give me one more count. Double check. I'll meet you at the bottom. Okay. And, I, and forgive me for asking you to do it one more time, sir, but I got it. Yeah. So we 
came in through the entrance, stepping over the weapons and all the stuff I described. We came up to the first victim up over here. I went to adjust his airway, we didn't do it. Um, he had injuries incompatible with life. At this point, Donnie and I split up. Donnie went up the left side to check for survivors. I went to the right. I had a victim smashed down in here from being trampled after shot with obvious uh, injuries incompatible with life. We did adjust his airway with no success. Came to the third victim. That was the uh, victim that we uh, talked about working in. In any other situation we would have, but we can't mass casualty. Donnie went back left, went up, and I went up uh, on the right side, finding another victim missing half the head in here. Another victim up here, and then we met at the female at the top. We gave each other a count, went back down. Before I have you sit back down, sir, did, did you guys find anyone to save? No, sir. Okay, thank you for, for doing that, thank you. Sir, when you were <coughs> done clearing theater number nine, did you leave the theater complex again? Uh, yes, sir. Came back out to the rear of the theater where my apparatus was uh, parked. Did you do anything else of a life-saving nature from behind that theater? Um, at that time, I was informed that they thought the suspect's vehicle was uh, uh, full of explosives, and so they wanted to evacuate. Um, once again, we made sure we had everyone... Uh, evacuated from that area before we left and then we retreated our truck out of that area and we put up about a 300 foot safe distance. Now I don't want to go into the details of what you heard after that but were you then dispatched to what you believe to be the shooter's apartment after that? Yes sir. Okay and my guess is for reasons we'll get into later you did not make entry into that? No sir. Okay. Can I have a moment your honor? Yes. Nothing further. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ms. Higgs, do you have any questions? Oh, no, thank you. I don't. Okay. And the jury may have a question for you, if you would give us a moment. Please. Council, please approach. Sir, uh, the jury has submitted a question, and based on the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law, I have concluded that it's appropriate, and so I'm going to ask it. The question is, for the third victim that you tagged black, you said that you wanted to work him, but didn't. Does that mean that he was technically dead, but you wanted to try and revive him? Yes, sir, that's exactly what it means. Any follow-up uh, based on that uh, question from the jury, Mr. Brockler? No, Your Honor. Any follow-up from you, Ms. Higgs? No, Your Honor. May this witness be released from his subpoena? You may. Any objection? No. All right, sir, thank you. Thank you. Members of the jury, it's uh, about 5.15, and so we're going to adjourn for the day. I want to remind you that it is important, very important, in fact, extremely important that you follow each and every advisement that I've given you. 
Uh, I am planning on reminding you about them tomorrow, right before the long break for the weekend. I say long break because we're not going to have session on Friday. Uh, but I know you know them by heart. I know that I've given them to you multiple times. Uh, I just want to remind you that they are extremely important. Uh, and so please, please follow each and every one of them. Uh, I want to call your attention to one particular one. As you know, there are times when the attorneys and I have to discuss administrative matters or legal matters. And in fact, you've had to wait for us a couple of times and you've been very patient. Uh, we're having those discussions a lot of times in open court. Uh, and uh, there may be media coverage of that. And so you need to be very careful about avoiding all media reports of the case because if there's a report about something that the attorneys and I have talked about outside your presence, then uh, you uh, need to be very careful about making sure that you don't uh, have access to that information. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, and everyone's nodding their head yes. So be particularly vigilant when it comes to the internet, when it comes to the radio, when it comes to the TV, the newspaper, uh, all mediums, just be, for all, all media, be, be very, very vigilant about avoiding any stories about the case, okay? Uh, all the other advisements are equally important. I just wanted to give you a, a further explanation of that one. All right. Uh, enjoy the evening, and I'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 8.15. Thank you, folks. He has exited the courtroom. Everyone may be seated. All right, the record should reflect that we are now outside the presence of the uh, jury. It's my understanding that uh, there was a member of the media who attempted to conduct an interview uh, in the hallway with one of the witnesses and the witness's attorneys after the witness testified. And so I'm going to bring uh, that person in at this time. Sir, you can come up to the podium, yes. Tell me your name, please. Jason Sickles. How do you spell your last name? S is in Sam. I, or for, your first name, Jason, J-A-S-O-N, last name, S-I-C-K-L-E-S. -S. That's S is in Sam, I-C-K-L-E-S. Sorry. S-I-C-K-L-E-S. -S. Yes. And are you with, uh, uh, what organization are you with? Yahoo News. Yahoo News? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, it's my understanding, sir, that you attempted to interview a witness after he testified this afternoon here in the hallway. There's an order that is in place that I issued that prevents any interviews from taking place uh, in the hallway. There is a specific area that's designated for that. Uh, and my understanding is that, that one of the members of the sheriff, one of the deputies of the sheriff's department, stopped the interview and asked you to conduct it pursuant to my order. Is that correct? Uh, not, not entirely. Can I, can, I, can I explain? Sure. Uh, it wasn't in the hallway. It was in the uh, lobby. And I attempted to uh, interview a gentleman who I thought was his attorney. Um, and uh, I, it was in the, the foyer, the very first floor, near the security. Um, I thought that they were exiting. So I, I yelled. It was Mr. Weaver. He had just finished up. And I yelled and asked if the man was his uh, attorney. I, in previous days, I had, had been introduced to the man. And he was with him in the court here today, and I thought that, and I said, I introduced and said, are you uh, Mr. Weaver's attorney? And I said, his name Tony. He said, no, my name's actually Tim. It's Tim Smith. And that's when the, the sheriff's deputy uh, tapped me and said, hey, you know, you can't do interviews in here. I said, yes. Oh, you're right. And I said, you know, we need to go outside. And we went out the doors and down the sidewalk. As we were going down the sidewalk, I asked the question, I don't know if you want me to ask I don't know if you want me to reveal the question. No, you don't need to reveal the question. <clears throat> and I, I, and then the family who I've known previously, they continued to talk to me, but I did not talk to them. 
and the sheriff's deputies continued to follow me. I knew we needed to get to the parking lot at that point, and I took notes, but, and they, they, they kept talking to me. But that's, and I apologize that I attempted to try to talk to, to the attorney, um, and I'm, I'm very sorry for that. I accept your apology. I just want to make sure that my orders are followed. I have issued a lot of orders, uh, and I have granted the media uh, as much access as I possibly can uh, in terms of the trial and in terms of information during the trial. This is a public proceeding, but there are rules that have to be followed. Yes, sir. And so I want to make sure those rules are followed. Uh, I'm not going to take any action at this point. I, I accept your apology. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of all the orders and that you understand that all the orders must be followed. Yes, sir. If there is another incident, uh, it's not going to go this nicely, and there are going to be harsher consequences. Do you understand? Completely. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, is there anything on behalf of the people at this time? Yeah, no, on a personal matter, can I approach, please? Yeah. Anything else on behalf of the people, Mr. Brockler? No, sir. Thank you. Anything on behalf of the defense, Ms. Spengler or Mr. King? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. I'll see you folks tomorrow morning. Oh, before you leave, on that issue that came up earlier today in terms of the um, pregnancy, when do you folks want to address that? Do we need to address that before Thursday afternoon? Do you want to do it Thursday afternoon? Tomorrow afternoon. Okay, we'll add it to the list tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. The court will be in recess.